everyone, and thank you for joining us this morning as we approach the one month, one month mark of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Russia's invasion has slowed, but the Russian army is still increasing in some ways its attacks on Ukraine's civilian population. With no obvious ending in sight, there are grave concerns that Russia will escalate the war, either by ramping up the human suffering for Ukrainians or by extending the battlefield beyond Ukraine, including possibly with our NATO allies in the region. At the Miller Center, we have launched an initiative that probes the dynamics and ramifications of the war. As part of that effort, about 20 faculty have been engaged in regular morning war room meetings several mornings each week. We've also launched a blog and are hosting a series of webinars, including today's. Today's conversation is with two of UVA's leading national security scholars, Philip Potter and Alan Stamm, who will help us examine some of the possible escalation scenarios we should be mindful of, as well as other paths forward for all parties involved. Before we begin, a few words on each of Philip and Alan. Philip is an associate professor at the Batten School and in the politics department, where he teaches foreign policy and international relations. Philip's research focuses on international terrorism, which is the topic of his collaborative project with the Department of Defense's Minerva Initiative. He has authored countless articles and published a book on um, electric-centric foreign policy in 2015. Prior to joining us here at UVA, Philip was a fellow at both Harvard and the University of Pennsylvania. So thank you, Philip, for joining us. And Alan Sam is a professor of, of public policy and politics and the former dean of UVA's Batten School. He's a university professor here, uh, which is the highest rank of professor. He reports directly to the president. He's also a faculty fellow with us here at the Miller Center. His area of research focuses on the dynamics of armed conflict, both between and within states. Prior to his time at UVA, Allen directed the International Policy Center at the Ford School of Public Policy and was a professor and senior research scientist at the University of Michigan's Institute for Social Research. He's also taught at Dartmouth College and Yale University. So thank you as always, Alan. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having us. Before we get started, please note we'd love to incorporate questions from the audience. Uh, so please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen and we'll get to as many of those as we can. <clears throat> and um, keep an eye out for more of these War Room events. A special thanks to the Frank Batten School of Leadership and Public Policy and the National Security Policy Center for co-sponsoring this event. Thanks as always to the George and Judy Marcus Democracy Praxis Fund, which supports these events. And a special word of thanks to Sally Gladden, whose husband Joe passed away last week. Joe served on our governing council for many, many years. And he and his wife, Sally, recently uh, gave a gift to the Miller Center that helped upgrade our video capacity, including supporting today's webinar. Joe will be deeply missed by all of us. And I know um, he would really appreciate and enjoy today's event. So without further ado, let's just get into it. Alan and uh, and Philip, I just love your initial thoughts uh, as a framing for as we watch this conflict, what are the US interests in this conflict, particularly as it relates to escalation? Uh, Alan, why don't we start with you? Okay, sure. Thanks, Bill. And first off, thanks for hosting this. And Phil, thanks for joining us also. Well, the, the I think the first thing to observe about this war is that, except for perhaps from the Ukrainian perspective, nothing is gone as either planned or expected from either the Russian side and perspective or from the American side. From a, a direct economic or business uh, or sort of demographic perspective the united states does not have huge interests in ukraine ukraine is not a member as rip has been noted numerous times ukraine's not a member of nato at the same time the united states has a great interest in broader european stability broader global stability and by that i mean simply not tolerating independent states or countries invading their neighbors. Um, it's a terrible precedent both for trying to manage and maintain stability in the international system in Europe as a whole, and it's also a, a terrible precedent from a human rights or a civilian population perspective. Phil, do you have anything to add? <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I agree with everything that's been said uh, thus far, but I would also add that I think U.S. interests are evolving. Um, or perhaps the perceptions of those interests are evolving in ways that I think could be, be both helpful and worrying. Um, I notice the extent uh, which, which Alan laid out to which uh, alliances are playing a larger role here than I think people anticipated at the front end. You know, I think if you asked uh, scholars and practitioners to assess the likely implications of this invasion for, for the U.S. Uh, uh, European alliance structure, it would have been a stress point, right? The, the notion would have been that, hey, you know, gas in Germany and uh, different political factions across the continent would lead to stress on, on NATO. Instead, we see very much the opposite, right? A, co a coalescing of, of alliance relationships. Uh, and so I, that then puts a bunch of things on the table in terms of, hey, is this an opportunity for alliance deepening and expansion? And is that in U.S. interest or is that a potential risk of the sort that kind of got us into this situation to begin with? Um, the other thing that I, I would note here is that this is, as, as Alan said, going much worse for the Russians than anyone would have anticipated, right? And so we have a uh, rival very much surprisingly on the ropes here. And I think that that then causes uh, folks in the U.S. to reassess their, their priorities and their interests in this, our, our interests in terms of, hey, let's extract as much as we can here, right? Let's push this to the max. Or is it a situation where interests dictate that uh, we lay off a bit? Um, and I, I think the personally, I think the right answer is somewhere in the middle, right? You, you probably want to be awfully careful about moving Russia into a, a situation of true desperation uh, for a variety of reasons that we can get into here. But at the same time, I, I think there are going to be pressures on the administration to perhaps go further than they should in pursuit of, uh, of those interests of sort of furthering U.S. priorities vis-a-vis -vis Russia. That's really great. Let me let me. Um, get us into this discussion of escalation, and I, I guess I would I would frame the question the following way: There are two parties, immediate parties in the conflict, that is Russia and Ukraine, but there are these other parties, including the United States and NATO, obviously, but other players as well. When we think about escalation, we tend to think about the parties in the conflict. Though anybody at some level could escalate this battle, so uh, let's start with Russia because I think that. The going presumption is since they started the war, um, they would be the first one to escalate. So what are those escalation pathways look like, um, uh, both intentional and potentially unintentional? You want to lead off, Al? Sure. So there's a, a couple of different ways this could go. Um, the first would be simply escalating an intensity of the attacks. And so it looks like the Russian plan was initially to capture the airfield in a couple of strategic cities, literally in two or three days. Uh, that hasn't happened. And so as their, the mobility of their offensive has stalled or come to a, a grinding halt, what's next available to them is large scale standoff attacks on urban centers, which turn into large scale attacks on civilians obviously because the, the cities haven't been completely evacuated. And so if we look at recent history in Syria, in Georgia, in Chechnya, the Russians haven't hesitated to increase the intensity of their attacks on civilians. Um, a second way that we've seen sort of signals of a broader escalation would be attacking other targets, meaning uh, border areas. And so there were reports of a Russian hypersonic missile, which is a basically just a super fast missile uh, that goes a very long way, but is faster than a cruise missile and lower altitude than a ballistic missile. Um, but that that strike was very near the border with Poland. Um, and an attack across the border into Poland would be a huge escalatory uh, violation and would you know run the risk of bringing a Poland directly, a US NATO ally and bringing the United States in. Um, there's other escalation possibilities uh, where if uh, President Putin feels that the Russians are at risk of actually losing versus being stalemated, uh, there's been a fair bit of talk about the Russians using a tactical or short range and 
relatively low yield nuclear weapon against a single target in Ukraine, for example, perhaps to try to definitively eliminate President Zelensky. Um, that would entail a significant rupture of norms over the past 70 years. But there, part of this depends on sort of what Ukraine and Ukrainian leadership decides to do as well. Phil, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that essentially covers the three buckets that I sort of put this in. One of these, I think, is underway, right? So there's already an enormous escalation against civilian targets. You know, in some ways, while that the human suffering component of that is is obviously tragic, I, I hardly think of that as an escalation. Um, and and the reason I say that is because this is very much in keeping with with Russian past behavior and doctrine, right? So there's very little surprising about the component that uh, once stalemated, they are effectively forced into using dumb weapons on civilians, right? They just don't have a lot else in in, in the toolkit. Um, the second escalation, which I think would be uh, you know tremendously worrying, in part because the U.S. responses to it are relatively limited would be into some sort of WMD situation. So not just uh, TAC nukes, but also ChemBio. Um, and there's been a certain amount of concern, obviously, out there uh, in terms of the Russians sort of preparing the field, so to speak, for some sort of use of chemical or biological uh, agents. Um, you know, and I, I would say that in terms of the limited yield of, of tactical nuclear weapons, they're, they're limited in comparison to strategic nuclear weapons, or at least some strategic nuclear weapons. But, you know, the, the amount of damage it would take to definitively uh, dispose of, of Zelensky would, would level Kiev, right? So uh, this is a, a very serious uh, situation and something that would involve a tremendous escalation. But the U.S. response to that would be, would be, it would be a challenging thing to come up with an appropriate response. The third category is uh, essentially accepting far more risk in terms of uh, invoking Article 5 uh, and, and, and that sort of thing. So I think the hypersonic attack is an example of this, but the closer that Russia gets to sort of towing the line in terms of invoking the wrath of NATO uh, and forcing NATO in, that has a sort of reciprocal effect on the way the U.S. and allies are thinking about this uh, conflict because, you know, they're seeing the Russians get very, very close to a situation where the U.S. might have to act. And I think the hope from the Russian standpoint would be that we would then step in and try to pull the, the Ukrainians back to the table or make them accept some, some concession because that's a place that we don't want to go. And so what we might see is Putin very much incentivized to sort of borrow uh, kind of a shelling kind of logic uh, to, 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 to incur a great deal of risk in order to try to achieve some sort of acceptable end to the, end to the stalemate. Well, I'd like to follow up with a question back to you exactly on that point, which goes to the motives of escalation. Do you, do you see it as reasonable to think that Putin might try to escalate, including attacking NATO just beyond the border, NATO supply lines before the border of weapons as they come in as a way of provoking a response. In other words, is, is there a small escalation that's that's calculated to try to draw us in for one reason or another? And if so, what would those reasons be? So I think, you know, it's always hard to get inside of other people's strategic logic. I don't worry too much about the small escalation to try to draw NATO in. At this point, uh, if, if Putin drew NATO in, the only way to survive and get back out would be to go into a, a much more escalatory, uh, potentially nuclear kind of situation. Right? So the strategic logic for me to have Putin sort of tempt us in is not a compelling one. I think what is compelling is, you know, so people have for, for a generation talked about uh, Russian doctrines in terms of sort of escalate to de-escalate. That's a, a simplification of what, what their actual sort of policies have been. Uh, but nonetheless, that type of logic of uh, you know, incurring a great deal of risk, getting really up to, to, to NATO in terms of kind of an eyeball to eyeball confrontation on the logic that NATO would back down first, I think that's where you're looking at potential escalation that could lead to a much larger conflict. And so the NATO coming in component is not the product of an intentional sort of pulling us in, 
that would be very easy to execute. It's much more in terms of miscalculation where you really try to get eyeball to eyeball in order to back us down. And instead, you know, a missile goes over the line and hits a civilian convoy or whatever it might be. Like you can imagine a million scenarios where, where something might go wrong. Mm -hmm. Bill, well, if I might, I, I think I'm going to disagree a little bit with my colleague here um, about regarding his point about uh, targeting uh, civilians and uh, urban centers. While it's true that essentially this has been the way that Russians have fought several of their recent wars and so from perhaps from a military analyst perspective it doesn't seem particularly escalatory i think from the perspective of voting publics it the perception is that it's an enormous escalation partly this has to do i think with the rise of social media and the availability of these images and short clips on platforms like TikTok and twitter but I, the, the political pressure here on NATO country leaders on President Biden, I think will grow up, will increase dramatically if we start to see really large scale attacks on civilians in places like Kiev and other cities in Ukraine. And the reason here is that there's a lot of history of essentially pendulum swinging back and forth. So during the Rwanda crisis in 1994, the United States and the Europeans didn't really respond because of what had happened in Somalia the previous year. Then if we look at the Balkans war, however, the United States and NATO intervene in Kosovo to prevent humanitarian crises there or intervene in an ongoing humanitarian crisis without essentially UN approval. So what makes this so difficult to predict or anticipate what will happen is there are precedents on both sides of states behaving extraordinarily badly. And then in response, NATO and the United States either looking the other way or in fact intervening. And so I think it, what drives the intervention, and this may seem unfortunate, but I think a big part of what drives those interventions is political pressure. If this war continues through into the summer, I think the political pressure on the Biden administration in particular will grow significantly as a result of the upcoming midterm elections in the United States. And again, this is something that drove the lack of U.S. intervention, for example, in the Rwandan crisis in 1994. And so I think one of the things that's important is to not just think about this as military planners might be in NATO or might be in Russia, but to think about how non-specialists will be observing the information coming out of this war zone. Mm -hmm. Just to follow up on that, because it's way more fun when we disagree than when we agree. So let, let, let's take this as far as it will go. Um, yeah, I, I, my, my take on this is that people have been talking about the sort of mobilizing effects of media on public opinion forever, right? So we were talking about the CNN effect as being something that, you know, suddenly the U.S. was going to be in every humanitarian intervention that possibly could be. Didn't really pan out. Um, we haven't seen public opinion numbers on this budge, frankly, uh, from the start of the conflict. And what we do know is that, generally speaking, you know, it, it, public's tire of these situations. They don't warm to them, right? So the fact that we've gotten this far without serious change in public opinion leads me to think that the amount of pressure is it's going to stagnate. It's not going to increase, particularly for things that are involved boots on the ground. Now, all bets are off if... Uh, you know, there's a massive chemical weapons attack on a, a, a population center. Certainly, if it goes nuclear, you know, at that point, we, we don't know anything about how people are going to react to to such an unforeseen situation as that. Um, but I, I think in the end, the, the pressures here for escalation are going to be much more in terms of coming from elites than from, from the masses, right? That this is going to be something where people try to press advantage on either side, um, and uh, we, we see miscalculation as a consequence of that, which then may flow down to public opinion. But I, I just have a lot of trouble seeing a public-driven uh, drive for a, a boots-on-the-ground intervention in Ukraine. And sometimes you see with the, the no-fly zone thing, right? That's a, a fun thing to talk about, but everyone who actually knows what they're, they're, they actually mean, what that means, says, you know, that's just a declaration of war with a pretty label on it. Right. Um, and elites have generally shied away from that and tamped it down. Certainly opposition parties, Republicans are going to take their pint of blood and, and, you know, say, hey, you're not doing enough. It should be better. But when when the chips are down, I just I just don't see the, the sort of intentional path to escalation here. 
Well, let me let me pick up on something that you both referenced too, which is the pressure that um, not just in the United States, but certainly in the United States, electorates are are already pushing as they're watching through social media and other things the the human devastation that's happening in Ukraine. The pressure on them to get more involved, send more troops, send airplanes, and I'm curious whether. From Putin's perspective, that in itself is being viewed as escalation of a sort. So, you know, the the thing that I maybe uh, worry about the most is uh, all the Stinger and Javelin missiles, which have proven to be so effective and helpful for the Ukrainians. To the extent that we are sending them in, how does that actually work? Is a as a NATO truck driver taking them to the border, leaving them there for a Ukrainian truck driver to bring through? And at what point is that a legitimate target from Putin's perspective? Have we already escalated by driving that truck to the border, um, even if we had been doing it before? And if they attack that truck and our driver is still in it on the other side of the border, did, did they escalate or did we escalate? There's been historically, there's been a distinction made between two distinctions. The first would be the distinction between people and weapons. And uh, so it, it's one thing for a country like Russia to target and for countries like NATO countries to bring weapons into to target Russia. It would be considered historically a quite different thing for people to become the targets on either side. Now, there are exceptions. So in the uh, war in Syria, for example, uh, the United States mistakenly targeted 200 plus uh, Russian military contractors. Um, and that led to little, if any, response from the Russians, which was actually kind of surprising. But to, to your scenario, Part of the issue here is that so far, the Russians have not have basically treated outsiders like NATO uh, to have the right to be able to supply or support their friends inside Ukraine. And that's, by the way, under international law, that's perfectly legal to do so. Um, sending not people the, not not to mention the Budapest memorandum, yes. which U.S., Russia, U.K. and Ukraine signed guaranteeing Ukraine's independence. So we have. We not just have a broad um, ability to do that, we have a specifically agreed to one with Russia, and yet they still might view it as an escalation. Absolutely. I think, though, once if, the again, the political pressure would be if Americans uh, ended up being killed, I think the political pressure would increase, uh, again, that we see precedent of relatively small numbers of Americans, either civilians, contractors, or uniform personnel, driving presidential decision making um, in Africa, in Bosnia. Um, recall in the uh, Balkan Wars, there was a small unit of Americans that were captured by Serbs. Um, and that led to a fears of tremendous escalation. Um, it, it did not at the time, but it was very worrisome. The, the, on the Russian side today, I think partly because they felt that this was gonna be over very quickly, they didn't really take into consideration the th threat of man portable but very smart weapons as a significant threat to them. Obviously, that's, again, not turned out the way they thought it might have. Um, I think a great risk of escalation there, however, is particularly with the um, the anti-aircraft man portable air defense systems. These could be carried across the border into Russia. Um, and so I could imagine, I'm not saying this is a likelihood, it's, I'm not saying it's going to happen, but I could, if we can imagine it, they can imagine it. And taking one of those weapon systems into Russia and targeting Russian uh, aircraft inside Russia by Ukrainians, um, that would be something that the United States wouldn't be able to stop. Um, and it would pose, a, from the Ukrainian perspective, there would be potential advantages to that. So for example, in World War II, the United States launched the Doolittle Raid on Tokyo simply to demonstrate we can bring the war to the Japanese. It didn't have any particularly strategic value in the sense of shaping the military outcome of the war, but it had a huge public relations effect. And I think there would be incentives potentially for the Ukrainians to do the same thing to the Russian people, to be able to say, we can bring this war to Russia just as you brought the war to Ukraine. From an American perspective, that would be hugely problematic. And so again, one of the challenges here is that 
looking forward, anticipating there are so many different pathways forward that increase the risk that it's very hard to predict what may happen. Mm -hmm. I think that scenario that, that Alan painted out uh, in terms of, of moving into Russia is something that I've increasingly started to worry about, right? So that, at the beginning of the conflict, that seemed very much sort of outside the realm of where this was likely to go. Uh, currently, you know, given Ukrainian su tactical successes, at least, uh, it's, it seems very easy to imagine a world, particularly as this moves into a more insurgency-based sort of phase of the conflict, where that becomes tempting even to a smaller unit uh, that may not be under direct control, right? Mm -hmm. um, I would argue that that, you know, it would be a terrible choice for the Ukrainians as well. Right, because currently there's sort of a public opinion struggle going on in, in Russia that would likely galvanize opinion. But particularly as sort of Ukrainian command and control comes down, it's easy to imagine a situation where you get some freelancing and that, that could be incredibly risky. Um, you know, one thing that, that I would note sort of in this conversation that I think is really interesting is the extent to which the US has been, I think, almost surprised to find itself on the right side of the sort of escalatory cycle here. Um, and in particular, with regard to the, some of the points that, that you raised, Bill, with, with uh, regard to sort of the weapons that we've been putting into the, into the system uh, in, in terms of sort of, you know, that, that type of access, in terms of what we're sort of have set the precedent that we're allowed to do. And so in some sense, we've sort of, you know, boiled the frog on the Russians where they had, they'd accepted, it was already happened that we had you know, trainers all over Ukraine for, uh, you know, a better part of uh, 10 years, right? We had tons of weapons flowing in for the better part of a decade. Um, and we just kept doing that. And so it's very hard from an escalatory standpoint to, you know, part of it is a, is a perception story and a, and a public relations story, which requires thresholds. And so you sort of have to be able to point to something and say, that's escalatory. You can't go and say, javelins, javelins are escalatory. Right, because the, the, we've been doing that, it's a wash. Um, and so that's why we've seen a lot of lines in the sand in terms of things that are identifiable thresholds, but perhaps not particularly significant for the war effort. So the MiGs, I think are a great example of this. You know, the, the stingers are way more important. Some of the conversations that are going on in terms of anti-aircraft systems, you know, truck systems, way more important. But those are, are very identifiable. That feels different. And so you see a lot more concern about that. And so that kind of optical component, I think, is just as important as the operational one to, to sort of keep an eye on. And, you know, given the, the fact that the Ukrainians have had such tremendous success with the, the uh, portable uh, systems that they have, there's very little incentive, I think, for countries to get into things that are, are more optically challenging. Uh, but perhaps not particularly important for the war effort. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I'm going to start drawing in some questions from the audience. They've already started flowing in. Um, two of them are on a similar theme. Edward Epstein and Alan Hench each have posed questions along the lines of how much pressure should we be putting on Putin um, ramping up the pressure on him? And does that count as escalation? So one example, not one that they raised, but that I'll raise is, you know, President Biden referred to Putin as a war criminal. At some level, that ups the ante for Putin. Uh, if, if the war is settled at some point, but he's been labeled by the President of the United States as a, uh, a war criminal, that doesn't suggest that the sanctions could go away when, if and when this is all done. Um, it suggests that they're going to be living in some sort of permanent isolation or pariah state as long as Putin's in charge. Do you, as a general matter, presuming the war continues to go bad for Russia and that Ukraine is on the offensive, even if they don't cross the border, at what level should we be seeing rhetoric like calling Putin a war criminal as itself an escalation that makes it harder to end the war? I think at this stage, it's going to be very hard to get uh get a, a transition out of conflict that hinges on on things like that, right? I, I think something is going to have to fundamentally shift in order to, to have this not be sort of a stalemate situation, right? I don't believe that, that Putin is likely particularly sensitive to statements like that. 
Uh, I don't think personally he's likely to be very sensitive to uh, economic sanctions. I think he's 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 playing a bigger game here. And uh, from a you know personal financial reputational standpoint, he's financially fine and reputationally I don't think cares what what the Biden administration thinks he is. And so I don't I don't see those sorts of logics as particularly uh, escalatory. I don't know that they're particularly effective either. Uh, but I don't, I don't see them as, as a substantial escalation because I don't think there's any scenario where Russia is trying to get back to sort of a, a status quo uh, situation here in terms of, hey, if you just turn these sanctions off, we'll leave Ukraine and it's all going to be, be roses. I, I think we're just way past that point. Hmm. Yeah, and I would, the only thing I would add to that is... Uh, while he's in office, uh, President Putin enjoys general sovereign immunity. Um, I think the the statement by President Biden was more for domestic consumption and simply speaking up, you know, sort of spontaneously, um, as he seems to be often want to do. At the same time, um, at the some point, uh, President Putin may not, I mean, unless he serves until uh, he passes away, he will no longer be in office. And at that point, I think that the if the impact of that would be that he simply wouldn't be allowed, wouldn't be able to safely travel outside of Russia um, for fear of uh, the International Criminal Court serving a warrant for his arrest. Um, but I don't think I agree with Phil. I don't think that has any significant impact on his decision making today. Um, and frankly, I don't think that the statements by President Biden along those lines, not that they do any particular harm, I don't think that they have any particular impact on people's feelings or the, the essentially political situation in the United States either. Mm -hmm. um, Lauren Hershey asks a question, how, how would you assess the possibility of a Ukrainian victory? You know, to, to what you said, Phil, it looks like it's sort of grinding into a stalemate, but there's no sort of game changer in sight. Given that, can Ukraine actually win? I think it depends what winning means, right? I, in, in some ways, I think Ukraine already has won um, in some important regards, right? It, 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 just like I, it, it's very hard to imagine, uh, you know, Russia packing up and going home and saying, hey, guys, just let the sanctions go and we'll forget this ever happened. I think at the same time, it's, 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 at the same level, it's very, very hard to imagine Ukrainians saying, okay, fine, we, we call uncle here, you know, go ahead, we'll be a, a Russian proxy state. Um, and so in that sense, there's been this sort of emergence of Ukrainian identity and uh, what will be, I think, a permanent resistance to whatever uh, Russian presence is there. You know, this conflict, like most conflicts, has made a fool out of everyone who tries to predict what's going to happen. But, you know, I think the probably modal view here is that it'll sort of lock in place at a certain point where you have kind of significant Russian carve outs around the, the edges of, of Ukraine uh, and, you know, some sort of pseudo border going on there. Frankly, I would I would argue that that is uh, a Ukrainian victory, right? That, that the fact that they still exist as an independent state with an ind independent political authority and that political authority is going to lean ever more westward uh, is is what victory looks like. I might reframe that slightly. So um, there's a famous aphorism attributed to a 19th century Prussian military strategist, uh, Baron Clausewitz, who said, war is simply politics by other means. And that led to a whole series of academic thinking in terms of warfare as bargaining. In that sense, Ukraine's ability to still exist, as Professor Potter said, that is, it's a success. But to, you know, to look at the destruction of your cities, uh, loss of several thousand combatants so far as a win, I think that's a bit of a stretch. But uh, I agree that Part of it depends on how you frame this. So I, I think the best analogy so far would be the 1939 Russo-Finnish War or the so-called Winter War. And there the Soviets invaded Finland. Um, the casualty exchange or loss exchange was about 50,000 uh, Finnish casualties and about 250,000 Soviet casualties. In the end, it, the war ended up stalemated. The Finns ended up giving up about 10% of their 
territory to the Russians, and they agreed to effectively be neutral. And then in return, the Soviets recognized Finnish continued independent sovereignty. Now, do you would you consider that to be a victory for either side? I think we would say that was something of a draw with a negotiated settlement. Now, considering where people expected things to be, as Professor pointed out, that would be a big win. Uh, for the Ukrainians if they were able to come out of this with a negotiated settlement where perhaps they conceded part of the Donbass region and the Crimea but retained their complete political independence that again I think they might not but the rest of the world might consider that to be a significant win for the Ukrainians but I also think we're a long long way from getting to that point partly because I think President Putin and uh, the people in his inner circle, while they did not expect this to be a long war, uh, I think are certainly both sort of politically and emotionally prepared for it to be so. The Russians have been fighting in Syria now for years, not months, um, and fought for extended periods in uh, Chechnya. And so for the Russians to simply say, oh, it didn't go as we thought, we'll walk, we'll go home. I don't, I think that's very difficult to see that happening. Yeah, let me, let me follow up on exactly that point, Alan. Um, on the, uh, the Russo-Finnish war, mm -hmm. uh, at some point, somebody said to Stalin, you're not winning. <laughs> you're losing a lot. What do we know about what Putin is hearing from his generals and his intelligence services, both domestic and uh, those military intelligence services on the ground, about the state of the war. We all think he's losing. Does he think he's losing? Are there any tells there, if this was a game of poker, that maybe he, he doesn't have the uh, ace queen that he thought he had? I mean, I would say that there have been some tells in terms of there's been some internal turmoil uh, in the security services uh, and among the, the upper levels of the military, right, that suggest that, you know, he's not handing out ribbons, he's sacking people and putting them under house arrest. And so that, that would be a poker tell. Um, at a larger level, though, uh, you know, at least at the unclassified level, there's certainly nothing that I know that, that would tell us what he's hearing and, and what he, he's actually perceiving, right? I would say that from a uh, sort of broader perspective of scholarship on how leaders like Putin uh, behave and operate, there's a lot of reason to be concerned that he's not getting as good information as, as he would want to be getting or should be getting, right? So the more personalistic a dictatorship becomes, the less good the information flows become. And that, you know, probably once we're, we're you know, looking at this 20 years after the fact from a, a more historical perspective, you know, I think a lot of people's suspicion is that a lot of the lead up to the war is going to be shot through with those types of pathologies, right? The, you know, fear of reporting bad information to the boss, the idea that might get you in trouble, uh, you know, graft happening, uh, thinking more about uh, protection of the regime than, than uh, military capability, those sorts of things. Uh, I don't know that we're yet at the point where we're here, we have sort of smoking gun evidence about uh, what the information flows actually look like. And that's not terribly surprising in an ongoing conflict situation, but that's, that's what we'd be looking for. Mm -hmm. To add to that, I think if we look at, again, other sort of military dictatorships or personalist regimes over the past 40 or 50 years, um, one, they tend to persist until they stop. And I don't mean to be snarky by that, but what I, what I mean is that we tend not to see a lot of information that uh, that's essentially that reveals what's going on. And the reason is because to essentially mount a campaign against a dictator like Putin is incredibly risky for those participants. Uh, if it doesn't succeed, they're all literally dead. Uh, and so they will keep any planning, anything that would lead to even attempts to to pressure Putin to change their policies would all be held in the closest of confidence within the Russian government. And we would not be aware of any of that. So to the, you know, in a slightly different direction, um, any reports of that that we see, my suggestion is to take those with the largest grain of salt possible. Um, and again, that's not to say that there might not be pressure 
of some kind building within the regime, but we're not going to see it um, because it's so risky for the individuals involved. Adding to that, there was a couple of days ago, the very large rally in Moscow led by Putin. Now, in our country, we tend to dismiss that as political theater, but I think we need to remember that political theater can be very powerful. Um, we saw that in our own country in the 2016 election, the, the 2020 election. Also, I'm hearing from colleagues that are Russian politics specialists that their interactions with Russian academics and Russian policymakers in Moscow have been quite surprising from the American analyst perspective that and the surprise is that they had assumed that there would be this sort of group of Russian academics, Russian policy analysts that would see things the way that we in the West see them. And the surprise has been at least as willing at least as these people are willing to share that while they may not have completely drank the Kool-Aid, they're definitely seeing things from a still seeing things from a Russian perspective, from a nationalist perspective. And so the idea that Putin is completely isolated within, you know, the leadership of, of Russia, I think is a bit off the mark. Uh, well, let me ask one question on the dynamics of escalation. And then there are, this is from the audience. And then there are a few other questions that go to broader questions of the geopolitics. The question on the actual dynamic, the escalation dynamics is cyber. Uh, uh, Fritz Heinstein is the one who asks, and the question is, if if Putin engages in cyber warfare outside of the Ukraine space, presumably they're already trying within the Ukraine space if they have the capacity, but if they go outside, does um, NATO's Article 5 mean that we have to retaliate or respond? The answer to that is nobody knows. Um, it has not been either adjudicated formally, nor has that question been addressed by precedent. Now, again, it's hard to know with any certainty about what's going on. A lot of observers of this in the cyber dimension have been quite surprised that we haven't seen more apparent effects of cyber attacks. One sort of observable aspect of this is though that Apple computing and Microsoft computing have been pushing out updates to their operating system multiple times over the last month, which suggests that there are zero day faults or essentially vulnerabilities in their operating systems that people are working overtime either in the face of actual cyber threats ongoing and, and effectively being able to block them or in anticipation of them. My hunch is probably a mix of the two, but it's very hard to know in the midst of this as to what's going on. Phil, do you have any observations on this that might be helpful? Yeah. I mean, I think this is the, to me, this is one of the most fascinating things about this conflict, right? Is that it is remarkably old school, right? This was, so this should have been a conflict if you sort of went to how uh, strategic thinkers would, would sort of game out a, a situation like this where it was all robots, cyber and space, right? Um, that's what we sort of think about. Instead, it is very much not that. Uh, and so the, the sort of dog that didn't bark here in terms of cyber conflict, I think, is one of the things that I'm going to be keeping an eye on uh, as we start getting more information in about what's going on. And, and as uh, Professor Stam sort of put out there, you know, we don't know what's going on inside in the trenches, right? But some combination of a lack of Russian capability and a uh, U.S. defensive capability is leading to an outcome where we're just seeing an awful lot less of this than, than we thought we would, right? And I can't speak to how that balance plays out, but, but the absence is a puzzle. Um, in terms of the escalatory component of this, absolutely right that this is, is ground that we have not uh, figured out yet. The general thinking here is that the only way you would really get this to be truly escalatory is if it led to the, the death of actual humans, right? So if you conducted a cyber attack that, uh, you know, derailed the train or, or, or some of those lines, uh, those are the types of scenarios that might lead countries to sort of see that as, as something different. Uh, as long as cyber stays cyber, so to speak, uh, I, I think it's not going to be a uh, substantial escalation. And in some ways, we've so far at least gotten off super easy because when uh, 
you know, everybody who tracks this stuff overly closely was, you know, keeping their gas tanks very full at the beginning of this conflict in, in anticipation that things might just get a little, little hairy out there. Uh, and that just hasn't occurred. Yeah, the only thing I'd add to that is the other aspect of, of sort of cyber conflict or cyber warfare is that deterrence exists. Uh, so for all of our concerns about Russian potential potential Russian cyber attacks in Western Europe or the United States, the reverse holds true. Uh, and as much as the NSA's sort of cyber toolkit was weakened by Snowden's revelations, I think that they've retained significant capacity in this area. And I would not be surprised at all if the NSA had made clear to their counterparts in Russia that any attack on U.S. or NATO allied uh, soil of a significant cyber attack would be met with similar but more so inside Russia. And so that what we may simply be seeing is, is effective deterrence, which we didn't see in the conventional space. Then one other comment on uh, Professor Potter's observation about not, this not going the way we expected in the context of sort of modern, very sophisticated, high technology warfare. One possibility is that we simply misinterpreted Russia's capabilities, much as we did in the late 1950s and early 1960s with the so-called bomber gap and the then subsequent missile gap. It's true that the Russians have demonstrated individual sort of one-offs of highly sophisticated weapon systems. So we mentioned the hypersonic missile attack. That was one missile. Um, the Russians have developed a new variant of very sophisticated fighter aircraft, but best guess is they have 10 of them and nine of them are not fully operational. With their latest tank systems, which again, we thought were as or more sophisticated than US M1 tanks or German Leopard tanks, it turns out they may only have a couple of dozen of those very highly sophisticated weapon systems. So as Professor Potter pointed out, what we're seeing here is a very conventional, almost old style, old school standoff weapons attacks in Ukraine. And this may be a result of, this is what actually represents what the real Russian army is capable of. And that for a variety of reasons, understandable, but not good reasons in the normative sense, we had overestimated Russian capabilities uh, over the past, say, 10 years in terms of the kinds of weapon systems, not only that they were able to develop, but more importantly, able to deploy and integrate together in a combined arms forces operation system. Yeah, and, and going to sort of that, what, what uh, Alan's hinting at at the last bit there, the, the lack of capability that I think has been truly astounding is sort of any uh, effort at jointness, right? They are not operating as a, as a joint force in any way, shape, or form. Um, and so, sure, they don't have the, the economic resources that we have, but the nature of their military modernization uh, did not sort of manifest in the way the organization operates. And I think that's fascinating. Um, part of what this means in terms of the top shelf takeaway, though, is that there's only one other military on the planet then that has this the type of kit and the potential organizational environment to, to apply it to effect. And that, that would be, be China. And, you know, one question that, again, this sort of raises for me is, you know, if you had an adversary that you thought had this high tech capability, uh, modern military, you know, formidable, dangerous, and we missed it, right? We were we were wrong, or at least many people were wrong. And I'll I'll cop to you know my I was wrong. I'm I'm surprised by the the poor performance here. You know what does that mean as we look at other forces around the world, um, and where might we be getting it wrong again? Yeah, let, let's stick on that for a second because you've you've raised the question that was raised by Peter Chapin, and you've answered it in part. If the war drags on, will China be more or less inclined to support Russia? How does this affect? escalation scenarios. One thing you wonderfully brought into this, Philip, is their own capabilities and capacities. Um, but does that make them more or less inclined to use them on behalf of Russia in some sense, or to think about using them in other contexts like Taiwan? And if they do that there, does that escalate this? In other words, does that truly take this into World War III territory? So I think you have two countervailing things going on here, right? So on the one hand, the Chinese have historically been pretty risk averse, right? And, and quite rightly so. So this is a fundamentally different situation, right? Russia has been in long-term demographic decline. Uh, the things have not been going well there in terms of the sort of basic metrics on sort of national power if they 
forecasted out 20 years. And so, you know, waiting that lacks a sort of a, an attractiveness. China's in, an, in the opposite boat, right? Growing economy, modernizing, taking those uh, gains, applying them to military capability, you know, there, there is a logic for bide your time. On the flip side, you know, folks are very concerned about uh, Xi Jinping and some of it, you know, we were already talking about issues of, of increasing personalism in Russia, same logic holds in China, those sorts of things, shorten time horizons, they, they make the, the policies of the state increasingly uh, adhere to the, the time horizons of an individual and the reputation of an individual. It's that, that pushes in the opposite direction. Personally, analyzing it on balance, I would say that the Chinese are not likely to throw in heavily with, with the Russians on this. They, they tend to be uh, very much uh, you know, looking out for China, un understandably so, uh, and therefore somewhat fair weather friends on these things. And while they've been really, from a rhetorical standpoint, pushing this, hey, we're, we're hand in glove in our relationship, uh, that's largely rhetorical for a reason in order to sort of uh, rally part of the world to them to really strategically challenge the United States. But the reason they have to say it so loud is historically it is not that compelling a case that those countries are going to be able to hang together uh, in a reliable way. And so uh, if Russia is going to become a pariah and you know become bogged down in an insignificant conflict, I don't think you're going to see the Chinese say, hey, we, we, we want some of that. Uh, you're going to see them continue to support them rhetorically, probably provide them some financial outlets, uh, maybe some minor weaponry that wouldn't be seen as over, overly escalatory, but they're not going to do the big stuff. Yeah, I'd add two points to that. One, one way to think about this is from a Chinese perspective, observing what's going on in Ukraine. First off, if the Russians are having a hard time doing this and they share a 900 mile long land border with Ukraine, if they're having a hard time doing it there, imagine trying to do this to Taiwan where you have to cross the Taiwan Straits. Um, the second thing in regard to the what's going on on the ground is, again, we've mentioned uh, these man portable anti-tank weapons or anti-armor weapons and the man portable anti-aircraft weapons. We were aware that these are important. So this, they were the, the Stinger missiles were a turning point, for example, in the war in Afghanistan in the late 70s and early 80s. But we're seeing that they can have devastating effect when they're deployed in huge numbers. And so this has to give the Chinese pause. The second thing in that is that the Chinese have not demonstrated the ability to do sustained large scale aircraft carrier operations. Now, they're compensating for that by building out essentially military bases in the Spratly Islands. But I think the way to think about this is we're not in 1939 in Europe where Germany had a, a significant material advantage over the Western European, other Western European countries like Poland, France, and Great Britain. It's more like 1935 where there are people in Germany that are looking forward and believe they could gain an advantage, but it'll take a few years for them to be able to do so. China is not yet, I don't think, to the position where they could cross the Taiwan Straits and effectively take control of Taiwan. And I think that what's going on in Ukraine is supportive of that view. In the longer run, however, I think that this essentially demonstrates the risks for the United States, that while we have much greater interest in Taiwan than we did in Ukraine, it also reveals to the United States that sanctions may not be enough to actually have any significant impact on the decision making or the anticipation of sanctions from a deterrent perspective. So, I mean, essentially, it, all this does is complicate our thinking about what goes on in Taiwan and probably, though, pushes that pushes that rock further down the road than it would be right now. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And one more small point to sort of support that case, um, you know, reversing the lens from looking at this in terms of the, uh, the cooperative relationship between Russia and China. Think of it from the Chinese perspective, looking at the U.S.'s cooperative relationships. One thing that's been revealed, you know, the U.S. has for years said, well, you know, we have our capabilities, but, you know, the real power is in, uh, you know, like-minded Western nations, the combined capabilities they're in economically, militarily. I think a lot of the rest of the world, quite rightly, was like, eh, maybe, but you all don't seem to get along that well all the time. I'm not convinced that that's a credible capability, right? The credibility of that capability at this moment is a lot higher than it was several months ago. 
right? And so I think from a Chinese perspective, they're looking at the same kind of logic uh, with regard to the Western alliance uh, that we're looking at with regard to uh, the Russia-China relationship. And in many ways, I think the tightness on the Western side is the, the surprising part here. Uh, and the sort of potential fraying or lack of credibility on the China-Russia side is, is somewhat more predictable. So we've, we've got about five minutes left and maybe what I'd love you each to do is give us a minute or two of closing thoughts. Um, and and the, uh, on the, the following knife edge question, which feels to me to be where the war is going, um, there is incentive for the United States to continue to at, at the very least support, if not at some level escalate sanctions against Russia, sanctions against third parties like China, to make the war more painful for Putin, um, not by directly engaging the US directly engaging Putin, but uh, militarily, but indirectly. On the other hand, there's an enormous pressure on the US to de-escalate every time Russia tries to ramp it up by threatening to use a nuclear weapon or attacking civilian centers. And I just love your closing thoughts on how to strike this balance on the knife's edge. Where, where do you lean into raising pressure? Where do you lean into showing uh, exit ramps? Sure, I'll, I'll start, Phil, and then you can have the last word. Um, so I think it, it may be a knife's edge, but I think it's a dull knife. Um, think of it as a butter knife. Um, the United States and Russia, previously the Soviet Union, have a long history of being in conflict with one another, but being able to not go to war with one another. And so I think those experiences will bear themselves out and be very valuable. At the same time, the United States has, I think, great incentive here, not so much with regard to Ukraine, which is, as I, I will insist, that we have limited direct interests there. At the same time, we have extraordinary interests in places like Taiwan and the rest of Western Europe. And that the more we push and maintain a position here, with regard to Ukraine, it essentially firms our deterrent capacity with China and Russian attacks elsewhere. Um, the I think the bigger, longer issue here is Taiwan and China. And so the longer the United States both hangs in there from supplying military to the Ukrainians, the better. And also essentially within the ability of the global economic system to sustain it, making clear that sovereign attacks on neighboring states will not be tolerated by the Western economic system, and it can lead to essentially the destruction of your domestic economy. I think that's a valuable lesson for other states to observe. Yeah, I, I, I very much agree with all of that. Um, you know, in terms of where this is likely heading, I think, you know, so I recall at the beginning of the conflict in Syria, you know, walking across a campus at Michigan with a very famous IR professor and like, how long could this possibly go on? So what, what, six months? You know, like there's no way that this, this, this goes on. And here we are, right, all this time later. Unfortunately, if I had to guess, I would think that that's, you know, some variant of that is what we're looking at here. Because I very much agree with uh, Professor Stam's point about sort of the staying power of the Russians in terms of not losing. Right. So maybe maybe not winning, but not losing is, is also a viable outcome mm -hmm. for them. And so that that kind of situation, as ugly as that is from a humanitarian standpoint, I think may be where we're going. And I also agree with this component of uh, being out uh, the U.S. and Russia being able to stay out of you know, direct confrontation here. They're, they're quite practiced at it. And neither side has a strong interest in, in going that route. Um, I think key to this, and one thing that I'm sort of paying a lot of attention to, which I think is interesting, is the informational component of it. So the U.S. seems to have sort of hit on an information strategy uh, and an intelligence strategy that is really important to keeping that pressure on Russia without getting it into an escalation stra uh, uh, escalatory spiral. Um, and a lot of that has to do with kind of getting inside of the, the Russian cycle in terms of information and misinformation, these sorts of things, um, and being way more transparent with sort of notional intelligence than we have been in the past. That relies on, on the U.S. and the West having more credibility in some circles than the Russians do. And we'll see how that plays out. But I think that that's sort of an important, an important part of achieving the effects that 
uh, Professor Stan was talking about in terms of keeping that pressure up for the longer term uh, situations in, in China and around the world. Well, Phil and Alan, thank you both so much. This has been a uh, really enlightening uh, hour for me. I, I, I'm lucky enough that I get to see you both on a regular basis to, to keep up on these issues, but uh, it's usually on a Zoom with eight other people and they're half hour Zoom. So getting an hour with you both is, is really a great pleasure for me and I know for all our audience. And thank you to the audience. Terrific questions coming in. I think I, uh, I got as many as we, we could get in, but I'm so appreciative. Um, as well as to the team that puts these together, Christina lopez Guitardi chow who has been helping drive this War Room initiative along with Howard Witt and his whole communi communications team, including um, the video tech team that put this event together today, uh, Mike, Woody, Kevin, and, and Rob. So thank you all, and we'll see you all at the next webinar soon. Take care. Thanks, Bill.